Greetings, New Covenant Church. Welcome to this time of worship as we join our hearts and our voices. It was our Lord Jesus Christ who said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, he who is and was and is to come. How important that is now to know that our Lord reigns. He manages all the affairs of life perfectly. Well, it's in light of that, I invite you to join me as we now pray. Father, we thank you that you have seated your Son at your right hand. That from that place, he exercises complete and perfect sovereignty. That you reign, O Lord. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And in times of difficulty, we go to you. You're our tower, our stronghold, our refuge in whom we find peace. And you are the shepherd who leads us. I pray, God, that this truth of who you are would so grip us in this time of worship that we would leave a transformed people this morning and that our worship in all that we do would be pleasing to you. Amen. This past week, uh, we sent an email out. I want to just highlight a couple of things about it. First, it has our new web page. Maybe you've seen it. A place where you can indicate any of your needs, requests. Uh, if you have something confidential, you can send that directly to the elders. Otherwise, we would love to pray for you. Please let us know how are you doing. Uh, furthermore, it's a place that displays the requests of others so that we can pray, uh, intercede on one another's behalf. And then finally, you can indicate whether you would like to serve. At this time, if you have a way of helping those who are in need, uh, you can tell us as much. The other thing I want to highlight is this new initiative called Care Chicago. Uh, we're going to be collecting items to benefit families who live in the Englewood, Chicago area. Uh, and so you'll see all the information there as to the sort of items we're looking for, uh, the box in which you will uh, put them. And then on Saturday the 16th from 10 a.m. To, to noon, uh, we're going to be collecting them. And so uh, hopefully you'll have a chance to participate. If so, then simply bring your box to the church parking lot. Uh, again, Saturday, May 16th, between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 noon. Well, I want to thank you for your ongoing giving. We understand that every good and perfect gift comes down from God. He is the provider. He is the generous one. And we are simply giving those things back to him for his glory and for the advance of his kingdom. So it's a joy for us to partner in that ministry. Our passage this morning is Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. So if you have a Bible, please turn there. Acts 1 and verse 6, this is the second sermon in our new series on the book of Acts. Luke, the physician, writes, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know times and seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he'd said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. There is a question that so many people are asking now. I hear it over and over. What does the future hold? Uh, the graduate of college who's going to have his or her degree in just a few weeks is wondering, where do I go from here? How do I enter the job market in this economy? My good friend who purchased a startup company after the new year, full of hopes and dreams for this business, is now wondering, what does the future hold? 
Those of you who are unemployed or underemployed, asking the same question. My friend who called me this week and said, hey, Pastor Chris, are we in the end times? Like All these events that are unfolding, is this like the book of Revelation? It's all concerned with the same question. What does the future hold? And, and how does our present circumstance relate to that? This morning, we'll have a chance to consider that question because this passage has a great deal to say about what God is doing and what God will do in the future. There are, in fact, four gifts that God gives us that allow us to face an uncertain future with confidence and with hope. Let me give them to you, and then we'll consider them in turn as they emerge in our passage. First, verse 6, God gives us a transformed outlook, a, a lens by which we can understand who he is, who we are, and how we are called in this world. Second, verse 7, We have a sovereign father, not just a sovereign God, but a father who is in control. Third, verse 8, we have a captivating mission, a great commission to go into all the world and make disciples. And then finally, verses 9 through 11, we have the promised return of Christ. So let's begin in verse 6. Once again, so when they, the disciples, had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel. Now, last week we noted this was the topic of conversation between Jesus and his disciples, the kingdom. And Jesus was saying uh, simply that the kingdom is not about a political entity. That was the popular conception at this time, right? That uh, Messiah would come as a military general, liberate the nation from the Romans, and establish his reign of peace. No, it's not about the political dimensions. It's about a person. It's about relationship with the king himself, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the the disciples are putting this together over the course of the 40 days when Jesus is teaching them. But you know what? It takes a while to digest new information. They have a, a tectonic shift that is happening in their understanding because they've grown up, all of them, from when they were small children with a certain set of expectations of what would happen when the anointed one arrived. And now that picture is quite different. And so they are undergoing this this gradual transformation of mind. And I think this is instructive for us because we have certain expectations of what life with God is all about. This week I was chatting with my daughter, Eliza, and she asked me, Daddy, what was it like when you were a kid going to church? And so I explained some things. I said, you know, I had this strange idea. I believed when I was your age that if I went to church, went to mass, God would be happy with me. And, uh, you know, life would go well. I'd have a good day. I'd be happy. And she looked at me strange and said, that's weird, Dad. Yeah, it is weird. Because God accepts us not on the basis of anything we do, but rather on the basis of what Jesus has done. We have all that programming, all those, you know, preconceived ideas. And uh, the Spirit you know, he converts us, we come to faith, a lot of it gets straightened out, but you know what? Not all of it. And so we're, we're all undergoing this gradual process of having our minds conformed to the image of Christ according to God's word. And so uh, that's the first thing for us to note, that it's not about my story. When I think about life and calling, it's not about me at the center. It's about God's transcendent mission. It's about Jesus, the King. He's at the center. He is supreme. And so I have opportunity to to check all of those beliefs and all of those inclinations that promote myself instead of promoting Christ. We have a transformed outlook. And next we find the Sovereign Father in verse 7. He, that is Jesus, said to them, It is not for you to know times and seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. There are certain things that only God knows. I mean, there's a great deal revealed to us in Scripture concerning the future. And as we'll see shortly, a lot of it has to do with uh, the pouring out of the Spirit who uh, empowers the church to live for Christ and, and the anticipation that one day Jesus will come back, our blessed hope. He will return and make all things right. 
Okay. Um, but there's a lot of detail there that's not revealed to us. And in fact, if you read through the Gospels, Mark 13, uh, Jesus says that not even the Son or the angels, only the Father understands the specifics of how this kingdom hope will unfold. That's something we need to recognize. And I think we're okay with that. I think all of us you know, understand that the, the, the biblical teaching about the end is, in a sense, signposts pointing forward into a mist. We're not going to explicate all the details. But we still want to know what the future holds. We still have a natural desire to understand uh, our experience as we move forward in time. And that's where this is helpful, I think, Because at the very center of verse 7, what does it say? It says, our Father has fixed these times by his own authority. It's it's not a a wild world of chance. It's not impersonal fate or natural laws or theistic providence. No, it is deeply personal. It is fatherly love. It is a paternal concern of the, the Lord who gave his only begotten Son for us out of his love, so that he could make us his children. Um, I want to give you a a text from the Old Testament that makes this point. Earlier this week, I just happened to be reading through Deuteronomy, and I came upon this passage, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1. You know how this goes. You you read the Bible, and you you you, you cover the same territory, but uh, there's always fresh truth for us. And here's what it says in verse Now again, here's the context, or 31, pardon me. You have, um, the nation has been liberated from Egypt. Now in Deuteronomy, Moses is preparing them to enter the promised land, and he's recounting what transpired. And here's what it says about the Lord's care. It says, in the wilderness, where you have seen how the Lord your God carried you. How did the Lord carry his people? As a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place. Now here's why this is so striking. We're talking about the wilderness generation, right? Men and women who uh, resisted God, who who chose their own way instead of entering in obedience at Kadesh Barnea, and they had to pay the the consequence. Uh, they, They wandered and died in the wilderness. And yet, what does it say? God carried them. Like a father carries a son, this this quality of love and affection that God had, even for his deeply disobedient people. How important is that for us to grasp, that God comes to us in that spirit of affection? That's something we need to know about the future. And then next, verse 8, we have this captivating mission. But you will receive power, says Jesus, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is the end time gift, the Spirit. We read about it in Joel 2. We'll get there uh, soon enough in Acts. But in our Minor Prophet series, we considered this. That in the end times, God will pour out his Spirit. There'll be, if you will, a democratization of the Spirit. You know, in the Old Testament, when the Spirit of God came on a person, it was often a, a king or a prophet or someone special. But now, in Christ, because our identity is grounded in the ultimate prophet and king, we all possess the Spirit. We all enjoy the same gift and the empowerment that comes. And why does the Spirit empower us for a certain reason? To be a witness, to, to testify to the good news of God's saving grace in Jesus. Don't miss this fact. It doesn't say you will do witnessing, right? as though that uh, task of evangelism is just one ministry option among others. No, it says you will be my witnesses, that, that shining forth with this good news strikes at the heart of who we are. Right? It's the leading edge of our identity. It has, if you will, ontological significance. You can't get away from it. If you are a Christian, you have this calling and this privilege of bearing witness to who Jesus is and to what he has done. And where will we do this? Well, Jesus speaking to his disciples says, it will be in Jerusalem, in Judea, 
in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's been noted that this is a, a centrifugal movement that reflects the book of Acts itself. And we'll see this, Lord willing, as the disciples go forth in their ministry. They're moving outward, even to Rome itself. And so we are called to, um, to have a heart for the nations, to be concerned about those who do not know Christ. Uh, this is the heart of God, and it is our heart as well. Now, here's what I want to note. Um, in addition to identifying who we are as Christ followers, in addition to empowering us to live in ways we couldn't possibly on our own, for us to focus on our calling to be a witness is crucial when we find ourselves in the, in the specter of fear, worry, and anxiety. Think of it this way. There's so many things that we can give our attention to, right? We can, we can worry about uh, our future uh, and in terms of whether we're going to have enjoyment. Will I make money? Will I have an experience of life that is pleasant? You know, that occupies, naturally, that occupies our attention. Uh, or we might be concerned with whether we will be healthy. I mean, a lot of concern about that now for good reason. Those two are legitimate. But the supreme concern for the Christian is whether we are fulfilling this call to embody and proclaim the gospel. That is what we are to have always before our eyes. And here's what I have learned in my personal experience. When I have that calling to be an ambassador for Christ at the center and I'm pursuing it with the strength God provides, all of a sudden that fear, that worry, and that anxiety fades into the background. It gets put into perspective. When I take my eyes off of myself and I put them on the Lord Jesus and, and, and the calling with which he has called me and called us, all of a sudden I have perspective. And I think that's part of what's going on here. Disciples of Jesus are to recognize this calling as a, as a priority that defines who we are and how we live. And that leads to the fourth insight Again, verses 9 through 11, the promised return of Christ. And when they had said these things, as they were looking on, he, Jesus, was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Clouds in Scripture commonly describe the presence of God. Think of uh, the tent of meeting in the Old Testament when Moses met with the Lord. There was a cloud. Or think of uh, the transfiguration when uh, Jesus was talking with Moses and Elijah, the theophonic cloud arrived from which God spoke, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Verse 10, And while they were gazing up into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. These are angels. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven. So, so get the scene. You know, Jesus has just ascended. Uh, how high? We don't know, but high enough for them to be looking heavenward. And, and they're staring up at the sky. And then this cloud comes. And this is not any old cloud. This is the Shekinah glory cloud, that same cloud that appeared in the temple. And so it's, you know, it's not like Jesus went 5,000, 10,000 feet in the air and was no longer seen because of the cloud coverage. No, he went up to some extent and then God enveloped him in this cloud, and he was seen no more. So there they are, uh, looking heavenward, the disciples, and these two angels come along, and they say again, uh, Why are you looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Angels often uh, serve in this way. They provide interpretation of supernatural events. Think of the empty tomb when Mary Magdalene and the other women arrived, and they're looking around trying to figure out what's happening, and there are these angels who explain that he is risen. And so, likewise, these angels are helping the disciples understand what is happening. And of all the different ideas contained in these verses, the idea of being alert, of looking forward in time to when Jesus will return, is central. Uh, he will come back just as he has gone away from you. 
He has left from here for glory, and he will one day return to this earth from glory. I want to read another passage for you that I think is illuminating. I made reference to it earlier, Mark 13, when I mentioned Jesus' statement about not knowing the the time or the day. I want to read a little further because it highlights this whole matter of looking forward in faith and expectancy. Mark 13 and verse 32 says, But concerning that day, this is Jesus speaking, or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake. Note that. For you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his own work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, you stay awake, for you don't know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. I think that's important for us, particularly during this time, is to be attentive. Because this quarantining season, I believe, is going to bring out the best or the worst in us. And we've heard a lot about the worst. Domestic violence is up. uh, Drug and alcohol abuse is up. People don't know what to do with themselves, and they're going crazy. And we can find ourselves in a similar place if we're not careful, if we're not vigilant, if we don't stay awake. Years ago during seminary, I worked as a guard. Can you imagine this? I worked as a guard in this large advertising firm in New England. So my job from six to midnight was just to make sure everything was kosher. No one was doing anything illegal. And I walked around with my uh, mag light. I looked very intimidating. And um, it was the hardest thing though, because I was up usually like 6 a.m. I'm studying Greek and Hebrew or whatever. And now it's 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. I'm exhausted. I can't keep my eyes open. Stay awake, right? Remain vigilant. Don't overdose on coffee, but stay awake. That was my challenge. And you know what? That's the challenge we now face. To not get distracted, to not get lulled to sleep, to not be drawn down the path of temptation by the evil one, but to press in in prayer, to to present ourselves to God each day as living sacrifices and say, oh Lord, give me this faith. Help me, here's the point, look forward to the return of Christ, to know that blessed hope is coming, and in the meantime, to rely on your spirit who is present and powerful. That, my friends, is who we are, and that is what we do. We don't know what the future holds. We don't know in detail, but we know the one who holds our future. We know that he is present, he abides with us, and we know that one day he will return. That is our faith And that is why we can proceed through these coming days and weeks and months and fulfill our calling to be a gospel witness, to shine brightly with the kingdom hope and the new creation so that others would look on and see that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Well, at this time, I would like to give you the benediction uh, and I want to offer the ironic blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and grant you peace. Amen. God bless you.